Check, check, check. Okay, let me just find this file real quick. Where it went, where it ended up at. Yeah, if it's... Who's that? Where did the file end up at? That's the, co the question of the day. I'm just trying to figure out where this file ended up at. That's good. It's not in there. Where did it end up at? Was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. You lost the camera? Yeah, camera's off. I'm throw the camera. Battling the elements. You streaming? Why not? Yep. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel Divine. Uh, praise God, everything got working. We had a little on our easy night. It's fun when. Wednesday night is supposed to be our easy night of setup, and we had some tech issues that we'll have to try to fix before Sunday, I guess, uh, with the wonderful world of Apple. So, tonight we're going to be in chapter 4, called The Mark of a Yielded Life, and I know that we have some that are homesick. We have some that are, um, we've had some, some falling that has happened this week, but praise God, um, we have just we've been really got some really great praise reports and all uh and and so we're we're just really blessed to know um that god is god is hearing the prayers and so that's always uh, a comfort um and so we had one fall from a ladder and one fall from a possibly a bunk bed i think or and all but at the end of the day it's uh both of them were you know, praise God, they're both alert and awake, and we'll keep them in prayer, and, uh, and, and just be praying for everybody else who's not here. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get, get going and, and get moving since we're already a little bit, little bit behind. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for today. We do pray, and we ask, Lord, that you be with us as we um, dive into chapter 4, as we talk about uh, yielding and and 
seeking that empowerment uh, from the Holy Spirit and the sanctification that happens uh, as well as us dealing with our uh, the stuff you need us to deal with Lord in the same time you need to empty out things and fill us and so we pray for that we ask Lord that you be with those that are that have been to the hospital that are in the hospital Lord that you would just continue to uh, provide help with their pain uh, and also just to heal them Lord uh, we ask Lord that you would just continue to be uh, with uh, those that are, are battling uh, illness and we just pray that you be with them and at the same time Lord we pray and just ask you be with us as we're here tonight uh, to hear from you we thank you so much for all that you're doing in this uh, church uh, we thank you for uh, uh, that that it, you know that the tech stuff did work out Lord that's all you and I uh, thank you so much for all the help that we always have the extra hands that are trying to uh, figure things out we thank you and and just the consistency and just the blessing that um, uh, that Wayne and Court uh, are here and and um, we thank you for them and Donna as well and uh, we just pray we we lift up each family each representative that's here Lord uh, that you would uh, be with them help them encourage them you know um, and and you know we also just pray as Miss uh, Miss Elba was talking about just the pain and the hurt that people are going through uh, not only in our in our city, but also in the hospitals. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would just continue to allow us to show up in mighty ways, uh, that we could glorify you and, uh, and and be there for those that are in need. Uh, we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, chapter 4. So, uh, last week we talked about the cardia. We talked about the heart. Um, and when we talked about the heart, we talked about that's where everything resides, our, em our emotions, our passions, our, and, and that's where the Holy Spirit indwells uh, when we give our lives to Christ. This week, we're actually going to break chapter 4 up in two parts. We're going to deal with the mark of a yielded life, the first half of it tonight, and then next week we'll deal with probably one of the hardest parts of this book as we start dealing with relationships uh, we start dealing with the way that we speak to each other uh, and the way that we handle things uh, it, it gets pretty pretty intense because we'll be talking about your speech and how how we we talk we'll also talk about edifying uh, God we'll talk about lying uh, we'll talk about uh, our attitude our attitude towards others, our attitude towards, or towards God. And then uh, we will also talk about our relationships, uh, not only submitting to God, but submitting to one another. And so those can be a little hard, especially in a church, because there are going to be times when you don't agree. And what we want is uh, hopefully to have two people that are yielded to uh, yielded by the Holy Spirit that would actually be prompted by the Holy Spirit not to run away but to actually deal with the problem um, because I've, I've seen that when when there's abrasiveness what happens is that person will take off to another church and they take the problem to another church and they do it with somebody else and it never gets fixed and so we want to be able to uh, to handle these things the way that God intended them to be handled so Mark chapter 4, uh, the mark of the yielded life, we're in the under, under his influence, yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit by Lloyd Pulley. It's available on calvarydivine.org. God bless you. God bless you. All right, so the first question that Lloyd asked, and this is one for all of us that we should be able to answer, if your Christianity was on trial, would there be evidence to convict you? Would you be found guilty as a Christian? Or would they not even know? Um, that's a big one. Because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people right now are, you know, there's so much going on in the world. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the blame is going towards, towards Christ and believers in Christ. And, and, it, and it is what it is. That's the... the it's just life we need to we need to understand that um but we cannot stop being who god has called us to be because we're worried about 
you know, how this group is going to perceive it or how that group's going to perceive it. We need to be uh, yielded to his influence and his power. And that's actually what we're going to talk about this weekend is we're going to be talking about two things that the Sadducees deal with is the struggle of the scripture and the struggle with not understanding the power of God. And we want to know that there is uh, evidence that that presence is, is abounding in your life. And it's, I love the example he said, if I, if I go to your house, there's evidence that you live there. Even though you're not in the home, there's evidence. There's your clothes, there's your favorite foods in the refrigerator. Uh, there may be pictures up of the family and you in them. Um, and, and there's evidence that that the house belongs to you. And so that's how it should be with us as, as Christ is indwelling in the cardia and is making residence in our home and our heart. There should be evidence that your life has been transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, three things that he gives us. He tells us that it empowers us and empowers us by imparting his life to us. And then he sanctifies us by setting us apart for his purposes. And then he transforms us by changing our character from the inside out. And so as we yield to his power and his influence, the evidence of his presence in our lives will abound. So we must be willingly, willingly to choose to live under his authority. And that is why Christians, this is a big one here, and I'll make sure you all get this. That is why some Christians grow and some don't. They're not willing to yield to the authority of Christ and the Holy Spirit that's been taking residence in them. And so there's no evidence is what happens. Is you, you'll have those questions. Was that person saved at all? Right? You were there when they got saved, but you'll have that question because it's been 10 years and nothing's changed. They're the same person. But that's because they have not yielded the authority to Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to grow them. And um, I was reading, you know, I think one of the things that Pastor Chuck would always say is once saved, always saved as long as you abide. Which is confusing. I even listened to him do a teaching on it, and it still confused me even more. You know, we're saved, uh, and it's past, present, future sins. There's a great article I'll post up, and, and y'all can read. It's uh, from my professor that he wrote uh, uh, from CARM, C-A-R-M, uh, and his name's Matt, Matt, Matt Slick. And it's, it talks about once saved, always saved. And he actually goes through the evidence of it. Um, and, and so it's, we have those questions that come up, you know, is that person really saved? Did they, did they really give their life to Christ? Well, only God knows that, you know, and, and that's the struggle. Uh, because you're like, man, you should be growing, bro. It's been 15 years and you're still drinking. You're still doing all the same things you were doing before Christ. But what happens is they don't yield, uh, that authority over to the Holy Spirit. And so it's, it's not just the yielding to the Holy Spirit, but, but being obedient to the will that God has been placed, uh, been, been given to them uh, to do, and they're not willing to do it. And Ephesians chapter 5, 18 is a verse that he gave, and this is one that we're very familiar with. And I think sometimes what we focus on so much is the wine part of it. I... It drives me crazy because we'll spend more time arguing about can I drink wine? And that's not what this scripture is talking about. The scripture is talking about wine, but he's talking about wine as being something that is wasteful living. It, it actually makes you make bad decisions when you're drunk of wine. Uh, you can be drunk or high on a substance and do the same thing. But it says, and, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be continually filled. And so Paul is given just a contrast here, because wine was so prevalent during this time. Uh, 
you know, can you be filled with or be drunk from other things? Yeah. You can be drunk uh, or be high on other substances. You, you can be, uh, there's a high that you get from pornography. It's been proven. Uh, and, and so what he's saying, though, is, is don't go to be filled with that, those things, but be filled with the Spirit. And the word that's being used there is to be continually filled. Continually filled. And so to get drunk means to be, become intoxicated by one uh, wine. So instead of being under the influence of the Spirit, you're under the inf influence of the substance. And so being filled with the Spirit is the only way to live continually under His influence. And so Paul is just given the contrast of alcohol and the Spirit. That's, that was the example. But I, I've heard whole teachings. Can a Christian drink? And it's not what the, the Scripture should be. Can you be filled with the Spirit? Is the, the, is the main thing. The word that they use there is, is, is in the translation that Lloyd had was dispensation, which actually means wasteful living. Wasteful living. And so people will tend to squander valuable resources. And, and I, I come from a family of alcoholics. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I've come from a family of functioning alcoholics. And they do fine, it, it, and then as soon as they're off work, they're, you know, drinking like a, a fish. Um, and and it, over time, it, it tears them down. They make bad decisions. Uh, it ends up taking control of them. And, and, and so sadly, I mean, it's, you know, when you, when you have somebody who's struggling with the substance, I think one of the biggest things that we, we know is when you're being filled with the wasteful things of this world. And, and I've talked to my dad about this is, is before because my dad is a recovering alcoholic. He's been sober for probably 25, 20, I don't know. It's somewhere in the 25, 26 years. Um, and he actually helps counsel people. Um, and one of the things he talked about is like when you stop drinking, the problem that caused you to drink is still sitting there. The thing that you never dealt with is there. The thing that you were trying to drink away, you're, you're left with it after you stop drinking and you still have, you have to deal with that. And that's what I love about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit helps you with that. He'll help you walk away from those things and, 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 and give you the, the um, power to do it. So alcohol impairs the senses. It blocks out balance and judgment and reasoning. That's why you always hear, you know, uh, I, I just remember being in, in the Army and guys would talk about it on the weekend. Well, she didn't look good at 8 o'clock, but by 11 o'clock she looked beautiful. Because they had them beer goggles on. They start drinking and it would inhibit their decisions. And they would make bad decisions. Sometimes driving alcohol, you know, driving drunk. Uh, whatever it is, they, it, it would be wasteful living. And we would see it almost every weekend. It, was, it, it, it is a controlling substance. There's a wonderful proverb on this. I don't know if y'all have ever read it in Proverbs 23. Verses 29 through 35. I read this this past weekend, and I know I've read this before. And it hit me like I was like, wow, I can't believe this is in Scripture. And I haven't caught this, and I know I've read this proverb before. But in Proverbs 23, verse 29, it talks about alcohol. And it says, who has, a, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go and try to mix wine, do not look at wine when it's red. When it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly, in the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder, which is a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. 
your heart utter perverse things. So out of your heart perverse things come out. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of, of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. That's the Proverbs. And that's somebody who's struggling. Struggling with wasteful living. The alcohol has become the thing that's filling them. The addiction has become the thing that's filling them. And, and so that's what the contrast that Paul is trying to get is to say, look, don't look to this thing, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and you know, and the short answer, can a Christian drink? Yeah. Okay? How much is too much? When you go from having a beer at dinner to start putting six packs back in the fridge over the weekend and they're gone, and then you go from six pack to 12 pack, there's an issue starting to build up. And so some people, and we talked about this last week, if they have an addiction, it's hard for them to be around the smell of alcohol. So even in a bar, it can trigger. Um, if you're struggling with meth or something stronger and you're, you, you've managed to get off of it and the Holy Spirit's helped you get past that, you shouldn't be messing around with alcohol because it's just going to draw you back in again. So, you know, one of the things that we need to understand is like that's the contrast that Paul is trying to give us to look at. It's the Spirit that sustains us and directs us and yields us. That's what it should be. And then there's completeness because he says, he says that we are to be filled. It's continually filled. To the full, to the top, lacking nothing. Nothing short of complete. So is there room for anything other, any other thing in your hearts? Then we are not filled with the Spirit. He, he will... Uh, and should be our will. His thoughts should be our thoughts. His desires should be our desires. The Holy Spirit is to be absolute domination of our lives. And so it's supposed to be God first. And, and what happens is, is when we're not filled with the Spirit, we, we do what? We allow other things into our heart. We, allow, we start allowing things maybe that you started doing back before you gave your life to Christ. You start, oh, it's okay to do that. And, and, and that's what happens. So instead of being filled with the Spirit, you're allowing these other things to begin to fill you. Because honestly, when we look at that word being filled, being continually filled, it should be overflowing. Because when it's overflowing out of us, it's impacting other people around us. And, and so... You know, that's one of the things that we need to think about is like we, we go on being filled with the Spirit. It's a continual thing. And there's, and there's compliance in that because it's a passive voice in the verb that's being used there. But we are to be vessels that God can fill and use for His glory. And so that means if God is going to use this vessel, the vessel should be what? Clean. The vessel should be clean. Ready to be opened and filled with the Spirit of God. And then it's a command as well. To be continually filled. And Paul's not offering up an option for living, but he's laying down the command of God for our lives. We are to be continually filled by, by the Spirit. But see, when we're walking in rebellion or sin... It, it impacts, and we'll talk about the grieving of the Holy Spirit. But sin will actually stop and allow things into our heart that shouldn't be there. In James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. You ever, you ever want to explain sin to a child? Do you know what the right thing was to do here? 
Why didn't you do it? It's a sin. It's it's James four seventeen. It's so basic the way it's broken down. I love Romans eight chapter two. Uh, Romans eight two. It says, "For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death." We have the spirit of of God in us. We're set free. There's a freedom. And and we're 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 walking away from the things that that are sin and death. It's a serious matter. Because when we're not walking in the spirit as we should be, we're not able to hear his voice. We don't know his will. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and through 16, it says, For for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We belong to him. There's a freedom in that. There's a joy in that. And there should be. We belong to God. We're his children. And let me ask you, didn't you, is there a time in your life where you go, man, I wish my kids would just obey, right? We've all been there as fathers and mothers. We, our grandparents, we're like, could you just obey just for a second? And you can imagine God going, why are you going back to slavery of fear and back to the thing of old, right? You, you have the Spirit in you. Just cry, Abba, Father, and walk away from that sin. And repent. Because you're my child. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So when you're being filled with wine, you're being filled with the flesh. That's probably the, probably the easiest way to look at it is you're temporarily filling yourself with flesh to forget your what? Problems. Let me watch a little thing on TV or let me pull up a video. I'm going to forget about my problems. Well, guess what? When you're done, your problem's still there. Let me smoke a little weed. I'll forget about my problem. When you get done being high, guess what? Your problems are still there. And, and so we need to understand it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us and reminds us along the way of our purpose and to be connected with Him and our lives is in God's control, not ours. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that the, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are, are called according for, to His purpose. So, there are times when we're going to go through troubles, hardships, pain, tribulations. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Are you going to run to the bottle? Are you going to run back to that thing that you did to to take away your stress? Are you going to be filled with the Spirit? Are you going to trust that God's in control? That's what we talked about this weekend. See, if we live a life under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the only choice we can make that will continually set us free from tyranny of the flesh is by living for God. That, that word again, staying filled, to be continually filled by the Spirit. I love that because there's a, a, a gentle grace to that which the Lord leads and deals with us. Remember this. We talked about this last week. He'll never override you. You have free will. You always have a choice to yield or not yield. That means you can respond with grace 
or anger. You can show mercy or want justice. It's like, how are you going to respond? Because you have free will. It's only as we choose to do God's will that's when that fullness of the Spirit, we see it working out in our lives. And, it, and it's a choice. You either choose to be led or not. And, and that's really where growth comes in as a, as a believer. The more you yield, the more you grow. And, and that's where people struggle. Is they're not willing to, they're like, All right, you know what, I'm already giving up Sunday. I'm here on a Wednesday. I don't really want to do anything else. And, and that's not where God's going to grow you. It's like if He's calling you to something else, He's calling you to that, that thing. But you have to be yielded to the Spirit to do that. Hey, Wayne, can you do me a favor and kill the AC in the, the children's classroom for me? The air conditioning in the kids' classroom? Can you turn it off? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I forgot to do that, so... So when we're living under His influence, we're continually choosing to rely on God's ability instead of our own. So do y'all get that? So you, when you choose to follow and you're yielding to His will, you're, you're choosing to rely on God's ability and not your own ability. And it is so easy to rely on our own ability. We all have special talents. God, you know, that, that, that we've learned over time. We all have special talents. You need help, bud? You sure? Y'all say hi to Jesse. That's Jesse. <laughs> and so we need to recognize those things in our lives that are hindering us from being filled with the Spirit. And so he gives us three points here. One is we grieve the Holy Spirit. Let me read you Ephesians. Now, he gives you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. But I'm going to read you Ephesians 4 from 25 to 32 just to give you a better picture of what he's talking about. Uh, so you get more of the context of what the Scripture is saying. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Do honest work with his, hand, his own hands so that he may uh, have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as it fits the occasion that, uh, that it may give uh, grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, when we don't do those things, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're going back to what we used to be. When we think, I need to allow my anger, I should be bitter, I should have wrath, there should be malice, that's the flesh. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. And, I, and honestly, it's, it's our sin that hinders the work from being done. So when we talk about and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that hinders Him from doing the work that needs to be done through us because we're in sin. And we need to deal with our sin. The second thing that it gives is quench the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, very simply, you know, uh, five words there, do not quench the Spirit. Right? Meaning do not extinguish the flame. So when we disobey and we resist the leading of the Holy Spirit, we, we begin to quench the flame of the Holy Spirit. 
And, and that means we need to confess and repent because if you're not willing to be led by the Spirit, that means you're being what? You're, 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 not, you're not following God, so you're being disobedient. The Holy Spirit's trying to guide you in one direction and you're going, no, nah, I'm not doing that. I, I, I just, I won't do that. I want to, I want to be upset. I want to be, <laughs> I want to be heard. And yet the Spirit's telling you, show grace. Give mercy. Be tender hearted. And that's not what you want to do. And yet the prompting's there. And what happens, this is where we, we were talking about is the person saved. What happens is over time, that person stops listening to the Holy Spirit. It gets harder because their heart becomes so calloused. It's harder for them to, to know the direction they're going. And they're being led by their flesh at that point. And there may be an amber there. And it can be relit. A fire can be relit for that person. But it's going to be requiring, it requires them to repent. And it, it, it's asking the Lord, like, man, I need a fresh one of the Holy Spirit in me. I need that fire to be ignited again. So we're not to extinguish or hinder the Spirit's work. And so that's even when, when the Spirit reveals sin in your life. Like he he tell like this has to go, and you're like no. <laughs> I'm not doing it. You're being disobedient. You're quenching the spirit. You're grieving the spirit. You're quenching the spirit. And you need to be careful with that because that's that's disobedience to God. And and it I'm telling you it gets harder and harder to hear the will of God when you're when you're knee deep in sin, and you're not willing to walk away from it. The third thing is, is we ignore His presence. I love this verse. It's probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it, it talks about the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the helper. Meaning that it comes alongside of us to assist us. But in John 14, 16 through 18, it says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Not while you're here on earth. <laughs> with you forever. Right? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and, and will be in you. And I love this because so many people think that God's not here. I can't see God. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you can follow this. But it says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And, it's, and it's the, it, it comes alongside to assist. And we need to allow it. Because I can tell you what I know about this life, I, I don't understand how I got through 39 years of my life without it. Because once you have the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to quench it. I don't want to grieve it. I want to keep growing. And, and let me tell you, just because somebody has a title by their name doesn't mean they should stop growing. You, you have to continue to grow. And, and the last one was fail to ask the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. It says, if then, you, uh, if then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, so God is not only wanting to fill us with His life, His words, His power, His will. But He's like, man, ask and you'll receive. Prayer. Pray. We have prayed, let me tell you something, we're, we talked about, we're a small church, and I know that we don't fit every little nick and cranny that everybody else has. 
But one thing I've been very blessed to see over this past year is to see the emphasis on prayer. And, and not only just praying just recently um, and seeing those prayers answered, you know, uh, one already released from the hospital and one possibly going home tomorrow. Praise God. Because both of them could have been, but God is hearing. We've seen businesses, and, and, and I've said this before, we have businesses in this church that shouldn't be functioning in this economy. But they're functioning because God is blessing them. And we keep praying. Let's keep praying for the businesses. We do that. We, we just watch uh, the people be baptized that we got to be a part of. And it's like, but there was prayer. We had three that showed up. We weren't even expecting, but we had been praying. And then they showed up. We had one we didn't even know. And then it just happened. But that's God. That's through prayer. That's through people praying, coming together and praying. And so we want to be a church that continues to... Like, I've, I've had people come to me and say, well, we need a building. Well, have you been praying for a building? It starts with prayer. My, my prayer is, is that we would see... At least half these seats filled. That's my prayer. That's what we need to be praying. Praying over every one of these seats that somebody would come. Because I, I believe until we see half these seats filled, that's when the building will happen. We have to continue to invite, continue to pray for the community, continue to be involved. And God will answer the prayer. But if we fail to ask, shame on us. Shame on us. You know, it's, it, it is a, a remembrance of, of, of those three things. Is that the Holy Spirit wants to empower us and sanctify us and transform us. But we need to get rid of the wasteful living. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the waste, the things that are wasteful to God. Okay? And y'all know what those are. I'm not going to sit and try to give you a list of stuff. I mean, you know, if it, like, I shouldn't be. I, I spent way too much time watching this thing. I binge watch, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's like I know there are other things I should be. I watched Case for uh, Heaven last night with Teresa. Great movie. I would recommend it to anybody. It's on Pure Flix right now. Really good. And they have one guy. You know how they always have somebody who talks about heaven? They've had a, a, a near-death experience. They had one dude that went to... He said he went to hell. And that... To hear that testimony... That dude came to Christ. It scared him that much. He talks about the gnashing and the tearing that happens and and when he came to and now he's a pastor he, he runs a, a church he, he's never been in church he was unchurched he was an atheist but that's what God does I got a video to show y'all I saw this and I wanted y'all to see this y'all and if you can't see it you can at least hear it when you're trying to understand how to listen to God how to understand his will. This will be such a great illustration for you. And I think it will help you so much. And, and I, I saw this and hopefully this plays and we don't have any hiccups. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. The pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here. And I fly a small airplane. And I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound... I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, no, no. You got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, 
I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're gonna. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, Tell we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said... I have to follow your voice? Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it, but listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. 
finally he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning. I knock at my door. And I open the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say you were the voice you're the voice that brought me home if you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice your head's full of voices and then we wonder why kids crash and burn we wonder why marriages are shattered and the lord's saying i'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me, stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm, stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice so hopefully that helps you understand we we have a lot of voices going on um, and will take us in directions we shouldn't go and and so and even when we can't see in the storm you follow his voice and I'll make sure the video is on the, the uh, Facebook so y'all can look at it a little bit better and hear it better. Um, and I'll make sure it's on the edit version. So this is where we say goodbye to y'all online. Uh, we appreciate y'all hanging in with us through all the technical stuff that we had. We're going to answer a few of these questions and then we'll finish part two of chapter four next week. So God bless y'all. If y'all need anything at all, if you need prayer or anything, just hit us up on calvarydivine.org. God bless. See